Okay, we can start. So welcome everybody to this new seminar of the IAU IAG Stats and Industry Info Seminar Series. We are very pleased today to have uh, Johannes as a speaker. Before we start, a few technical info. Due to the usual high number of participants, we prefer to keep all the microphones unmuted. Muted. So we recommend to keep the question for the end of the seminar. The standard procedure is that you raise your hand and you are gonna unmute your microphone. Anyway, in case you have a very urgent question during the talk, you can write it in the chat and I'm gonna allow you to intervene. Thank you for your understanding. So today the speaker is Johannes Buchner from the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Johannes took his PhD in astrophysics at the Max, Max, Planck, uh, the Max Planck Institute in 2015. Then he got a, P, a postdoc at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. He has been a visiting researcher at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in 2019. And currently, he's a postdoctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute in the High Energy Group. Johannes works on supermassive black holes, gamma ray bursts, and uh, exoplanets, applying astro astrostatistical methods that include nested sampling and Bayesian population inference. Today, he's going to talk us about uh, exploring the space of parametric spaces in the space sciences. Quite a tongue twister title. So, Johannes, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this introduction. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to give a lecture on some of the topics I'm uh, very interested in. And uh, yes, uh, let me get started with uh, saying a few words on my astrophysics research, uh, which will not be the focus of this talk. But I do want to um, give you an impression what I what I usually spend uh, some chunk of my time on. So I'm uh, studying supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies. And uh, we know they exist. Uh, that was the recent Nobel Prize um, uh, for. And so the question then is, how do they become, how do black holes become so supermassive? And why do they sit in the centers? of galaxies. And uh, if you think of, of this as the galaxy center uh, and the galaxy uh, is, is uh, surrounding this, how do one open question is how do galaxies stream the gas onto this uh, black hole? And this I probe with the Erosita uh, All-Sky Survey, which takes the large census of these systems. And the second question, um, is this, uh, in this very nice visualization, this uh, this obscuring structure here. Um, we know it exists, but we don't know what it is. Is it some sort of inflow um, that's stalled there or, or a failed outflow? And this I've been probing with X-ray spectroscopy. And uh, um, I only mention this because it will briefly become relevant later that if you had a, a direct view of the X-rays being produced close to the black hole, you would observe sort of a power law um, energy spectrum. But uh, if you have this obscure in the way, um, these softer X-rays are absorbed. And so you can learn something about this obscure from X-ray spectroscopy. And this week, there have been a bunch of papers on the hex p mission, which gonna do a, is, is going to do a marvelous job at this. So let, let me sort of set the stage for the for the um, talk today. So the context is that in um, the space sciences, in astrophysics and, and uh, related fields, we want to do inference. And um, a little bit of a special situation in these fields is that we do work with uh, physical laws like gravity, for example, and that those uh, have the property that you can um, take these models and extrapolate and, and that you learn from some types of observations and you can extrapolate to other types of observation. And so classical example here is mercury, um, which was used to test gravity in a new regime. And somehow these having these physical laws uh, makes the situation slightly different um, 
I think, although I don't know exactly what's the demarcation line, it makes the situation slightly different to just coming up with phenomenological models that describe the observations you have at hand and sort of summarizing those observations. Now, uh, I will talk specifically about model comparison and estimation of the parameters of such physical models. And I'll do so within a Bayesian framework. Um, and I'll focus here in particular on parametric um, spaces that are continuous in their parameters and have dimensions of, let's say, less than 100 parameters. And so within a Bayesian framework, what we're talking about then uh, is, is doing some form of um, integration that tells us, well, um, what region of this parameter space contains most probability. That's the form of uh, parameter estimation, how it is uh, accomplished within a Bayesian framework. And so just as a concrete uh, basic uh, problem uh, from extragalactic astronomy, here is an observation of a special type of galaxy, an ultra diffuse uh, galaxy. You see it's, it's barely visible. And uh, what these authors did here is from these marked uh, points there, those are globular clusters. What they did is they took a spectrum and measured the velocities of these. And those measurements you can see on the right here, um, there are nine such, um, such uh, globular clusters and you have the velocity measurement. And then they asked the question, well, how, how much additional scatter is there in the measurements beyond this measurement error? What's the intrinsic or what is the over dispersion? And that's astrophysically interesting because these velocities trace the gravitational potential of this galaxy. And the conclusion of this paper was that there is uh, quite little gravity. And so there's very little dark matter in this galaxy. And so we're, from an astrostatistical point of view, we're left with the question, how do we determine the over dispersion in such a noisy measurement? And so one way to go about it um, is to remember that um, these measurements are describing a probability distribution. And then you can go in with a Bayesian inference and try to infer a sort of a, a sample distribution of these measurements. So um, one way to do it is you say, well, I don't know the intrinsic uh, velocities, um, but I'm going to assume they follow some normal distribution. And I want to know the no uh, I introduce some additional parameters, which is the mean and the standard deviation of this normal distribution. And I know that the observations tell me um, the, the likelihood, basically, it tells me, uh, a con it puts a constraint on what these uh, velocities can be. And that's really what these blue uh, probability distributions are. And um, finally, we need to put a prior on these uh, means and, and standard deviation of this population distribution. And once we've done that, we can write the posterior on these, on these possible uh, distributions as this, which is just, the uh, again, the posterior with the velocities. And we're integrating out the velocities because we don't care at them, about them at this stage. And we can then expand this posterior um, following Bayes' theorem and say, well, we have these population parameters, the width of this distribution. We have the velocities which follow this distribution. And we have the observations which uh, constrain the in uh, specific velocities. And that's a very basic example of the hierarchical Bayesian models. They are very broadly applicable in astronomy. Uh, for example, you could think, well, what if this axis is time, then what you're doing is measuring and uh, how much variability there is. Um, but uh, I want to emphasize some, some more aspects here, which is um, if you are from some uh, schools of thought, you might wonder, why is there uncertainty in the data in the first place? Um, if it's the raw data, um, then it should be observational facts. 
And <clears throat> what these blue uh, distributions here really summarize is outputs from, from another analysis. So in a Bayesian framework, you can think of, uh, of, of these as marginalized likelihoods with, with integrated away um, some nuisance parameters. And in astronomy, it's uh, very important to calibrate our observations. So typically we would um, uh, get rid of some nuisance components that are not relevant for the astrophysical study um, and uh, take into account systematic uh, effects. And so we are sort of taking away and summarizing away um, what our instrument uh, ob observing system is doing. And that's also, I think, the reason why sometimes we talk about Gaussian data or Poisson data, which in isolation doesn't really make sense. Um, but we're sort of packaging away um, this, this, in, uh, this instrumental uh, process. And so if you go about it in this uh, divide and conquer approach with the hierarchical Bayesian model, uh, instead of have, building one gigantic hierarchical Bayesian model, you have this pluggable series of reusable analyses that we can stick together. And uh, indeed, you can reuse posteriors if you use some uh, flat priors, for example. And people have done this for, for many years, but I find uh, this particular reference there on the bottom right uh, quite readable. So this is sort of a, uh, an example of, of one very simple inference problem in astronomy. And you can find these uh, models everywhere. But now, um, I don't want to just talk about one specific application in astronomy, but I was interested in what types of inference problems do we have in general? And that's a difficult problem uh, or different, a difficult question to ask. <clears throat> Sorry, Johannes. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Jeff Scargo. And it says, aren't the velocities of globular clusters deterministic, not random, due to gravitational effects? So the I can, at, um, at this particular observing time, they are distributed. The, the velocities are unknown. So you're quantifying um, their current velocities. <clears throat> but you could uh, put in another gravitational potential as well. I didn't mention that. Well, I'm, Jeff, no. I'm, ju I'm just, uh, I don't quite understand why they're treated as a, as a, prob a probability distribution. They're pre presumably some um, un unknown function of the, you know, the orbits of the, those particular clusters about the center of the galaxy and the halo of the galaxy and so on. So, um it, it, it you're treating them as a um stochastic process i'm just wondering well um if i'm misunderstanding something there so they're treated as something you don't know a priori where these global clusters before observing um, would lie in velocity space it's modeling the not knowing rather than saying they're not deterministic. Okay, maybe we can discuss more of, after. Sure. <clears throat> so now I want to uh, come sort of to a survey of uh, astrophysical problems. And uh, if you've uh, come across my work, um, you the possibly most uh, probable way you've come across uh, me or my name is by uh, nested sampling packages, which include PyMultiNest and UltraNest. And those packages are widely used in astronomy and they're sort of the foundation of many um, uh, people's work that ask uh, specific astrophysical questions. And so what I did here is I went to GitHub and looked um, where these packages are used and drew basically from their repositories how they apply it and um, 
And particularly, I went to their example tutorial, looked what is their typical use case, what is their um, fitting problem that they are trying to solve. So what I have here is from um, a Planck measurement of the cosmic microwave background, some cosmology uh, being fitted from gravitational wave events uh, by the first uh, 3D detector event, um, uh, looking for the gravitational wave signal from a neutrino detector, um, trying to infer something about the oscillating neutrinos in the atmosphere. Uh, here is a gamma ray uh, inference problem, uh, trying to understand the Crab Nebula and some nuisance uh, uh, sources nearby. And these are exoplanet uh, characterization. So here in particular is this uh, radial velocity time series we are trying to find a periodic signal here, but uh, the measurements have some red noise, which can be modeled with the Gaussian process. And that makes simply applying um, a periodic run not that trivial because um, you have this red noise and you have all these aliasing effects as well. And this is so an analysis with zero planets, one planet, two planets, and three planets. And here is some transient analysis. Here is an example from my work, which is looking at sort of this absorbed um, power law um, and a nuisance component uh, with very low count data in this case. And we do want to understand the accretion on this. I showed you uh, a sample distribution with the Gaussian. And sometimes we do just want to fit a line to some scatter plot, in this case, a power law relation, which teaches some, us something about um, how galaxies hold their mass. And so I have this uh, sample of uh, inference problems that I drew here. And so uh, what can we do with this? So if I manage to fit and get posteriors, here are some pairs plot plots or corner plots. And you see sometimes some of the parameters are poorly informed. So basically you get back to prior and some parameters are highly informed. You see sometimes we have very complex degeneracies between pairs of parameters in terms of their contours. And uh, we might have very strange tails that are very non-Gaussian. And for this problem I was showing you um, with the low count data, we actually have two modes in this parameter space. One uh, unobscured one that cannot be differentiated from a heavily obscured with a nuisance component. And so how can we characterize these situations? So here I came up with uh, some ways of characterizing this. One is you can simply count the number of fitting parameters. And then you can ask how much did we learn in this, uh, in this situation from the data, which is classically defined as the kohlberg leibler divergence, the information gain going from the prior to the posterior measured in bits, essentially how much the posterior is narrower than the prior. Then you can count how many modes you, you have in the posterior. Here I did this very simply by making histograms of the marginals and looking for gaps. Um, and that works reliably for the problems I was looking at. Then you have sometimes these bananas like in this LIGO uh, gravitational wave event. Um, and you one way to characterize um, such situations is to measure the, to approximate this with a Gaussian and measure how much information you lose. So again, the kohlberg leibler divergence from a Gaussian approximation to the full posterior. Um, and, final, and, and then you can also measure this situation, how much the information gain is on this parameter alone, um, and this parameter and this parameter and so forth, and take the best informed parameter uh, information gain um, divided by the least informative parameter information gain, which I call here the inequality in how much information you gain in each parameter. And then there are these two, which require a little bit more explanation. Um, so here I'm quantifying um, how this posterior falls off. 
And if you imagine these uh, contours for a moment as likelihood contours, what I can uh, quantify is what's the what's the volume? So let's say um, this dark blue one. What's the volume that contains five percent of the most uh, of the highest likelihood um, uh, concentration of the evidence so of the integral um, and take the ratio to the 95, let's say this is the light uh, purple here, um, that contains 95% of the integral. And so you can imagine, uh, depending on what uh, sort of uh, likelihoods or, or shapes you have, then um, these, these ratios would be very different. And for a Gaussian likelihood, uh, this has a characteristic value. And indeed, you can make curves like this, where you plot how much volume is enclosed as you go down and down in likelihood. And uh, here I also quantify uh, phase transitions. And phase transitions, um, what it meant here is that you can have the situation initially that you have a relatively poor fit. For example, imagine you try to fit a sine curve to this. First, you sort of get the um, uh, sort of a plateau there. Um, and you can put a very small sign signal anywhere, really. So you have a large uh, region of the parameter space where you can put this, this signal. But then at some point, you find the right uh, location to put this sign. And your likelihood goes up dramatically. But now you have a very little um, volume in this parameter space where you can wiggle around. So you have this situation where you initially have a plateau, and then you have this peak on top of this plateau. And some algorithms uh, like um, uh, thermodynamic in integration struggle in this situation, especially if that slope is steeper than minus one. So what I do here uh, to quantify whether this situation occurs is to close this curve with a power law of minus one and basically measure the importance of this relative to the ent entire um, integral. Now, I haven't explained yet how I actually compute this, but hopefully by the end of the talk, you, you will become convinced that this is actually possible and to do so reliably. But let's assume we can do this. Um, then for each of those uh, inference problems here, I give those characteristic so how much information we gain in logarithm of bits, um, this tail weight parameter, how many modes, um, this asymmetry and how much information we gain um, and how much we deviate from uh, a Gaussian and uh, the importance of these, these phase transitions, which are very important you see here on these um, time series uh, uh, fits. And here you also have the cost in milliseconds, how much uh, time it takes to evaluate a single model. So let me just put this on a plane here where you have all of these axes. And what you're looking at here is each uh, dot corresponds to one of those inference problems in, in uh, the space sciences. And so what you have here is a space where each point represents an inference space drawn from the space sciences. So this is what the title promised of this talk. And hopefully this is uh, having a bit of a wow effect because now you can think about what, well, what are we doing in astrophysics? What kinds of inference do we have? And you can try to look at this and, and see if we have some patterns, some types of problems that we more likely analyze than others. And if I look at this, I don't see any such patterns. So I, my takeaway from this is the inference problems we have are very diverse. Yeah. And so um, this ties in also with the historical development of Bayesian sampling algorithms. And here I've listed a few types of methods uh, in somewhat chronological order going from optimizers and Gaussian, Gaussian random walk metropolis, which have some limitations that we had to overcome 
And uh, here's the affine invariant ensemble sampler MC, very impactful to our field and uh, nested sampling uh, with region samplers, including pi multinest and, and so forth. Uh, and then in higher dimensions, some other packages. More recently, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which requires differentiable models. And uh, perhaps the next generation here is simulation-based inference. Um, but that's the sort of uh, might, might make you wonder, why do astronomers <laughs> keep developing these sampling packages. Here I just showed the Python ones. And the answer is that we do want to answer physics questions. Uh, and these physics questions have these complex parameter spaces where if you take an off-the-shelf algorithm, they sometimes break down. And you can see that this these developments are extremely useful for astronomers by looking at the number of citations um, of these packages, which often have more than a thousand uh, or even 10,000. And so it's so these, this sort of uh, developments are the foundation really um, of, of many astrophysical in investigations these days and commonly featured in workshops and so forth. And so there are two more aspects that I want to focus on. One is, there are astroinformatics aspects that I'm not going to try to get you excited about. And there are astrostatistic research aspects, which is we want to deeply understand what these methods actually do and then apply them in a smart way. But there's an additional development here. And uh, that development is, uh, OK, you can sort of apply these samplers on, on on some, some problems like the ones I showed, but we're entering a new era, which is really started by Gaia. There's before Gaia and this after Gaia, if you will, where we have now measurements of millions to billions of physical systems. So Gaia, Erosita, uh, TESS, uh, the Swiki Transient Facility, and so forth. These are already uh, 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 sort of have taken data, but there are, of course, more and more um, coming up. Euclid, you've probably seen beautiful images. Um, and and uh, Vera Rubin uh, is another example, as is SKA. So this used to be called big data. I guess now we don't just want to have the data, but we want to do science with it. So the term I see more frequently now is data-intensive science. And the question really is, how do we, how can we do physics with millions of sources? A uh, keyword there is scalable inference. So just to state the obvious, the data volumes are large. Um, now, if you'd want to answer some specific physics question, you're not going to use all the Gaia sources. You're going to subselect to some clean sample. And then you can also use this divide and conquer analysis that I mentioned earlier. Um, also in your, in your favor is that computing power is cheaper than ever. But there is a problem I want to focus on here, which is that the human time and focus do not scale to these millions of billions of systems. So you cannot get away anymore with hand initializing or tuning samplers to each, um, to each data set. And indeed, um, the number of corner cases really gets gigantic and the number of, of uh, and the diversity of the collected data is, is, is quite large. And you just cannot visually inspect a million of fits. It's just not feasible. So my question was, can we have Bayesian sampler that is perhaps slower, maybe 10 times slower, but it gives you some guarantees on that it's going to work, <laughs> that it's going to work a million times. And that was the question I, I, I wanted to focus on recently. And you can go about this in two ways. One is sort of the empirical approach, which is you take these uh, test uh, problems that I just introduced, and you test the method. Somehow you know the true answer. Either you simulate data or, um, or or some other means, and then you are reasonably confident that for these inference problems, your sample does the right job. Uh, but I want to focus here on another approach, which is analyzing more deeply one particular algorithm. Um, the one implementing an alternist as the default, which is um, Rad Friends, was the original. 
version with a Euclidean matri metric. And the sort of refined and more efficient one is, is called ML friends. And so what, what I'm trying to do here is uh, analyze and understand the behavior of this algorithm, um, sort of an analogy to, in computer science, you would go about proving uh, that, that this algorithm does the right thing and sort of rule out entire classes of problems that could occur. So for this, I first have to introduce uh, nested sampling. Now, previous speakers in this uh, series have already done that. So I'll try to keep it a little bit uh, sh shorter. So for the for computing the posterior over this, let's say, two-dimensional parameter space, you can go about um, uh, the integration. Like here, you, you sum up all these the tiny cells, and that would give you the evidence. Um, in this sampling, we go about it by uh, dividing the space into contours of constant likelihood. And so you would uh, divide the space into these shells and uh, multiply the, the, the volume of these shells times the height, which is given by the likelihood. And so how, how do we compute the volumes? Um, also, sometimes these, these shapes might be extremely complicated. And here the trick is to throw into the space, uh, let's say here, uh, five life points. And then in the first iteration, you would discard the lowest likelihood life point, and you would never again look at any part of the space below this likelihood that you just discarded. So all this purple volume would be uh, removed in the fir first iteration. And uh, now we can estimate what's the volume here um, from order statistics. And that's sort of illustrated here that if you take away uh, from a uniform sample, the worst or the rightmost in this case point, you can estimate the contraction of this uh, with a beta distribution that depends on the number of life points. And so nested sampling does this iteratively and keeps, uh, in, uh, keeps track of the compression of the volume. That you, at each iteration, you have the volume, these delta x's, um, and you have the likelihood that you are cutting your space at the moment. And so you see, we don't actually have to compute the, the shapes, if you will. And in each iteration, we sample a new point so we don't run out of life points. And we have to do that by sampling from the entire prior, but excluding the space uh, of too low a likelihood. So excluding the any likelihood below the point we just took out. Um, so this is the drawing replacement here. And there are proofs available. Um, that show that this procedure uh, converges in terms of that the posterior samples you can obtain, basically these, the product of this, are the posterior samples then, or their weights at least, um, that the posterior that you obtain converges to the true posterior and that the evidence, the integral, uh, converges to the true evidence. Um, but there's a, a, a step here, which is how do we draw this replacement? How, we, how do we draw a new point um, from the prior subject to, constrained to, having a high likelihood higher than the, the thresholds we currently work on? And if you're interested in this topic uh, in a bit more detail, there were two reviews this year uh, on nested sampling, one sort of more pedagogical, on, on focused on applications and one here fo focusing more on the methods that people have developed in the last 20 years to make various aspects of this uh, methodology more robust and, and more widely applicable. And that includes uh, the mathematical theory behind it, how to estimate it, uh, the, the evidence, for example, best, when to terminate this algorithm, how to diagnose issues, um, and finally the step which is this likelihood restricted prior sampling. So let me go into that in a little bit more detail. So one of the earliest uh, techniques for doing this, I want to go into here, which is, remember we have this unknown arbitrarily shaped contour 
that we don't actually know about, and we want to sample at a likelihood uh, uh, from the prior above the threshold uh, implied by this. And so this technique um, of uh, ellipsoidal nested sampling um, takes advantage that the, of the fact that the life points already uh, fulfilling the criterion of, of being above the likelihood threshold. And they sort of trace out this space. And so you can build uh, an ellipsoid around these life points and try to sample from this ellipsoid. Um, but you see here in the illustration, this would leave out some of the space that you're supposed to sample from. So what they do, do is expand this by some factor and um, then sample from this enlarged ellipsoid and reject points that uh, have too low likelihood. And this is for many problems reasonably efficient. Um, you might also wonder why would you choose an ellipsoid? Well, in the high data regime, there are some theory, theorems which suggest that the posterior order likelihood in some situations would become normal, in which case you have an ellipsoidal distribution. <clears throat> but people have, of course, tried other shapes. I illustrated some complex posteriors or likelihood contours. And that um, one, one famous one is where this figure is also from is multinest, which does a clustering algorithm. Now, I don't particularly like um, this fudge factor introduced here. So let's see if we can take an idea from machine learning to get around that. So what I'm doing here is uh, sampling, subsampling with replacement to get a training sample. So these are the blue points here. Um, and the rest would go into the validation sample. So in this bootstrapping procedure, I would build an ellipsoid around these training points and then enlarge this ellipsoid to make sure that I recover all the validation sample. And now online, I've learned the enlargement factor. Now you can do this once, but you can also do it m times. And remember the worst case, so the largest enlargement factor, and this is the, the factor you want to apply then when you use the entire life point set, uh, finally, for a very robust conservative algorithm. So this sort of emulates other possible realizations of your nested sample run, and it gives you some safety guarantees. And now I want to come to ML friends, which is basically the same idea, except you put an ellipsoid around each life point. And that leads to interesting properties. So now, just as an illust illustration here, um, some situations um, with the life points in blue, and then from these life points without any tuning parameter, fudge factoring factor parameter, is a region generated, which is the red one here. You can think of this as well as sort of a kernel density estimation with a top hat, if you will. And you see that for different uh, geometric situations, you have different uh, regions being constructed and you would sample from this uh, red uh, contour and reject um, if, if, if the likelihood is too low. And you see the the, you see quite clearly that the more life points you have, the more densely sampled, also the lower your parameter space, the more efficient this scheme works. Now in 2014, I analyzed this um, uh, in a little bit with, uh, in a little bit more detail. So the first uh, insight um, that I recently came to is how often are points in the training sample versus in the, in the validation sample. So simply, what are the properties of bootstrapping? And this leads to this very interesting probability distribution here, um, which includes the Sterling number of the second kind, which tells you about how many unique partitions there are of k life points, uh, uppercase k, that you can subdivide um, such that you select k and the rest basically remove uh, the rest of the factors, remove the ordering of that. 
And now, if you look at the expectation of this probability distribution, you get this. And basically, the conclusion is um, you expect, on average, for a reasonable k, that uh, two thirds would be selected in the training sample, and a third would go into the into the uh, validation sample. And here is the variance. I have not seen this written down anywhere, but I'm sure it is somewhere. And now we can ask, well, what is the probability that a point would never be in the validation sample? And so um, if in one round, this is uh, this probability, but if you look at M rounds, you can put an upper limit here. And the key takeaway is that if you want with a thousand life points that this never happens or with this very small p-value, then you can say, well, I'm going to do 45 rounds of this bootstrapping, and then the probability will be less than that. So in this way, we can be very sure about this procedure, uh, uh, having considered not having sampled this point. Uh, more recently, I've learned about a very interesting mathematical tool, which is Poisson point processes. And um, the way, uh, so I was introduced to this by a colleague who was interested in matching two catalogs on the sky. And if you assume they are both uniformly sampling, uh, samplings of point sources, you can ask, well, if they are overlapped, what is the nearest neighbor distribution? And you can analyze this with Poisson point, point processes. More recently, I've tried to apply this to this problem. Now here, just want to introduce some basic properties of this. Um, so first of all, um, a homogeneous point process would have a uniform density, and you have this realization of it. And uh, you can ask what's sort of the density of this, which is called the intensity in statistics. Um, which is lambda, and we, we actually know this. It's the number of life points divided by the current prior volume. And nested sampling keeps track of that. So we actually know the intensity. It's that within the contour and zero outside. And then we can also learn uh, something about um, a, a sphere. If we put a sphere around a point, and um, the sphere has a radius r, what's the probability that we wouldn't have sampled another point within that sphere? And that you might recognize sort of as a cross-section-like uh, formula where you have the, this lambda here and the volume of that sphere. Here's the unit sphere volume times r to the dimensionality. OK, so now we have some basic equipment and we can try to apply this. So um, if you look at leaving out uh, points with bootstrapping and you assume this approximation of two thirds, one thirds, you can back out what's the radius you would uh, get after M bootstrappings. And this is basically just taking this formula and reverting it to get R out. And this is assuming um, we're working in the interior of this Poisson point process. And this would be the R you would infer by this bootstrapping procedure after n iterations. Now, if you don't have it, this continuous space, but more complex contours, the R would actually be higher. So this is sort of a lower limit on the R you can uh, obtain. And now you can ask a very interesting question, which is how often can this go wrong? And so the question is, if you are in this uh, space somewhere, what's the probability that you don't have any life point nearby within R max? And again, we can use the formula here and compute the probability of having missed this uh, part of the space. And the takeaway is that for reasonable numbers like a thousand life points with this uh, parameter uh, that we introduced before. And the probability to, to have made so this sort of mistake of not having covered a space that we should have covered is extremely low, okay? So what you have here now is that at each iteration, 
um, the uniformity is maintained because the sampling space um, is a superset of, um, of this restricted prior space. And so by induction, nested sampling with this algorithm um, maintains uh, correctness and converges to the true posterior and evidence. And the surprising thing here is that you can actually implement this on a computer and you know something even though you've run it only for a finite computing time. Remember MCMC, for example, um, the, the convergence that people may, uh, are quite comfortable with is that if you run it infinitely long, you converge to the posterior. And uh, you can detect non-convergence, um, but it's difficult to make statements about um, uh, proving convergence within a finite uh, time. There is, of course, several caveats here. I've only sketched the proof. There are some approximations in there. And there is, of course, the usual uh, caveat that any Monte Carlo algorithm cannot find all the arbitrary flagpoles you could put into the space, but we know this. Um, that this algorithm has the resolution that you give by the light points. So uh, people have taken this um, uh, this algorithm um, because of these properties and applied it. So the, the Ultranest package in particular is aimed at this extremely high robustness, maybe low efficiency, but uh, high robustness so we can apply it to many physical systems. And so here you see two applications, uh, one for my work where I've applied this uh, to variability detection of uh, 30,000 sources in Erosita. Um, and another team, um, which is the XMM uh, to Athena group, which took the entire XMM uh, archive which is a X-ray uh, telescope that's been operating for more than 20 years and fitted 300,000 sources with these, um, each with four to six dimensions. And so you, if, you, if you think about parameter spaces, you're looking at there over a million dimensional parameter space, if you will, but of course it's broken down into many ind independent fitting problems. And so, we've really achieved here a, a form of scalable inference that, that you can rely on. Now, um, this is my last slide. I want to give a bit of an outlook on, on, on where all of this is going. So we already see um, developments of machine learning inside samplers, uh, nested samplers, and of course, MCMC as well including normalizing flows, for example, or um, uh, predictors of whether a sample will be inside the, uh, the, the likelihood contour. Another exciting development is emulators, uh, deep learning emulators of model components. And we've seen extreme speed ups of these. Um, here on the right is an example from a radiative transfer models model for supernova where we really get um, many orders of magnitude speed ups with this. And there are also some techniques for uh, obtaining posteriors directly. I would like to learn more about this. Um, in particular, I have uh, questions about how to reuse uh, such tools if your experimental setup is, is different. And here I've tried to emphasize a bit um, some more or less fundamental astrostatistics research um, very interesting developments are, are, have been highlighted on diagnosing nested sampling. We just had a workshop this summer on nested sampling, and, and, and that's a very interesting development, diagnostic tools. And here I've pre presented some analyses on what we can say about um, how, how robust these methods are. And so with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to the discussion and questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Johannes. Very interesting talk. Very full of concepts. So now it's time for discussion and questions. Feel free to write in the chat and 
we unmute your microphone. Okay, Jeff. Yes, uh, can you hear me okay now? Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks uh, for this this nice talk. Um, in the area of point processes, Poisson or otherwise, have you thought about um, using tessellations um, as a sort of a diagnostic? They, they um, might get at uh, other types of information perhaps than you're interested in, but for example, a, a Voronoi tessellation of a set of points the statistics of the the volumes of the Voronoi cells can be uh, very interesting and and provide a lot of um, meaningful information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for this comment. Um, so we, I've I've looked at. So I think in if if you're considering um, problems that are not limited to a very low number of dimensions, two three or so. If you're thinking about 10 dimensional problems, I think these uh, geometric uh, methods, including all of these region based samplers, uh, start to break down and become very inefficient. And I think that is perhaps also a limitation of, of such, such tessellations. The interesting thing about this analysis um, that I, maybe I didn't emphasize very much is that there is that the dimensionality cancels out here that I, I, I have a demonstration here on the robustness independent of dimensionality. Now, the efficiency is not independent of dimensionality. I have some results on this as well. It, it, it's exponentially bad with the um, curse of dimensionality, of course, um, but that is sort of a neat uh, uh, property here. But that, that's a good point on the tessellation. I should look into that uh, some more. Maybe there are some insights there. Thank you. Uh Yes, but you're absolutely right. Um, the um, the algorithms tend to uh, uh, break down, as you say, or just become incredibly uh, long for dimensions. I, I've never gone above a dimension of well less than ten. Uh, around ten is is really miserable. The the algorithms are linear in the number of data points, but they they're uh, it's a horrible function of the dimensionality. So. That would be a limitation, but it's a very nice uh, outlier detection. Uh, for example, uh, if, you, if you do it, the looking for large, large cells uh, typically are um, connected with out, outlier points. Anyway, th again, th thanks. Okay, so another question from Fabio Acero. You should be able to speak. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for, for the presentation. I really learned again uh, more than uh, just reading the papers, especially about ML friends. Uh, so if you go back to the uh, slides about ML friends in particular, so yeah, how in, in the papers where you did the experiment or the numerical experiment, at some point there is a limitation in dimensionality for these specific uh, algorithms and uh, so where do you think the limited of, of course, this is data specifics, but uh, from my experience after 10, 15, then it was getting really, really slow. And, and what's the reason of it is that it's having a hard time to draw this shape in high dimension or is it just cost or is it because really the shape then in high dimension, especially if you have non ellipsoidal uh, regions, yeah, yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, so we should sort of separate here um, the cost of constructing those regions, which is trivial. Um, so for all intents and purposes, I think um, this can be implemented extremely fast, and that, that's not a problem. But the in high dimensions, um, essentially, you have a lot of. So if you think of this, but in a, in a sphere. You, you have lots of holes and the more dimensions you have more holes. So you don't know where is the boundary exactly. If you think in really high dimensions, every point is at the hull, if you will. 
of of this space and and you have a very poor handle on on where you should draw this this boundary and so um that's saying the same thing as um distances really break down in high dimensions and so the padding you have to sort of apply there is very large to be safe and so you you end up with this proposal region which is very uh, large and which makes the subspace where you should sample where, where you actually wanted to sample from a small fraction which means many proposed points lie outside also an aspect here is that if you think um, of a sphere um, or an n sphere as you go to the higher number of dimensions most of the volume lies in the shell of that sphere this may be um, quite unintuitive but you essentially again make exponentially worse sampling uh, with dimensional <laughs> typically people then Um, okay. Typically, people would then switch um, from this algorithm to a slice sampling, which you can turn also turn on in Ultrans. Okay, so it's not the the time to compute this; it's that the efficiency of the proposal is really low. Yeah, exactly. Becomes really low, so you have to draw a lot, and they all end up in the garbage. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Thank you. Okay, time for one last quick question from. Uh... Jeff again. Um, okay, th thanks. Sorry, I, be, I was yelling at my my dogs a minute ago because they were barking not at the speaker. But um, uh, one other generalization that your talk um, inspired me to think of was I noticed all of the um, in one of your early slides you listed a bunch of characteristics. They were all properties of the um, of the posterior. Um, Mm -hmm. There, the sort of your, pr your parameter space was um, uh, discrete uh, projections in some sense of the p posterior as a function. So, but the generalization would be to to treat the, sh the really it's the shape of the posterior that matters. And of course, there's a lot of uh, technology for dealing with shapes of of probability distributions, um, measuring information theory type quantities and so on. Is that a generalization that that you thought of for for um, th this kind of stuff. So um, these most of these are continuous properties, uh, not not discrete ones, and I'm I'm using here information gain, which is from information theory. So I'm not entirely sure what kind of shape uh, characteristics you're referring to. Well, um, uh, maybe I it, it's hard to explain in a in a minute or so, but. Um, Sure, there are con these are continuous properties that, but they're discrete, conceptually, so to speak. Um, the mode is a is a just a a kind of a discrete conceptual property of a um, distribution. Um, if you specify the shape of the posterior, all of these all of these seven uh, quantities are are defined. That's that's the only point I'm making. So it's really a shape space. A continuous shape space that's uh, another generalization that I'm thinking of. Yeah, um, I think we, we do have, we sort of do have the entire shape uh, in form at least of posterior samples, um, but here we want to simplify to get an insight and so that's... that's sure, yeah, these mm -hmm. these are physically meaningful properties of the of the shape, so... Anyway, thanks thanks again for a, a nice talk. Another last question from Jason Lee. Yeah, so uh, I'd just like to ask that um, because there could be um, different observations of the same astronomical event where different methods on the Earth, for example, gravitational wave or light for the same events. And I'd just like to ask that would the observations for the same events be somehow more similar to each other in terms of the nature of the data, so which eliminates the need for robustness of samplers in these kind of situations or not? Well, okay. So if you treat them independently, um, I suppose you have a re re repetition experiment and then you can 
perhaps look at it from a frequentist viewpoint. But typically, I think we want to uh, combine the information to get even more information, and then you would multiply the likelihoods and you would have um, sort of a special case uh, where you consider all the data. I'm not sure that goes in the direction you're you're asking, but yes, in principle, you can, I mean, that this is this is one way to go about it, right? That um, if you are fitting, um, keeps giving answers and your follow-up telescope tell you that wasn't the right answer. That's an empirical demonstration that uh, something's off. <laughs> and uh, probably people will stop you at some point in, in proposal um, committees. <laughs> okay. So I think that that's all for today. Let's thank again Johannes for the very beautiful talk. I remind you that the registration would be shortly available. And uh, let's see you in a month. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you, Johannes.